Derek, my colleague, and I would like to share some of the work that we've been doing um, in Contra Costa on the ground. Um, and we are really passionate about this work, so we were really excited when we heard that the, the Contra Costa Watershed Forum was interested in hearing about pollinators. Um, and so um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. In addition to the watershed work that I mentioned that I do, um, I also head up our Monarch Conservation Program. Um, and then Derek, do you wanna go ahead and introduce yourself again? Hey everyone, I think for the most part you all know me, but I'm the Agriculture Conservation Coordinator at the CCRCD. I also help to manage the Marsh Creek watershed and um, and one of three that run the education program. Um, so Lisa and I are gonna fill you in on some of the pollinator focus work we're doing with urban producers and how you can get involved. Um, well, most of you are most likely familiar with the origins of RCDs or resource conservation districts. Uh, just a brief reminder that we were created after the Dust Bowl to support farmers uh, in preventing and recovering from desertification. Uh, this includes soil conservation practices, uh, such as implementing cover crops, uh, adding compost, mulch, and hedgerow plantings, uh, just to name a few of the broader range of practices. Jump forward 80 years, and local projects in Contra Costa now meet a broad range of resource needs. Uh, which involves environmental education, uh, ecological restorations, uh, advocacy, and what you might recognize as sustainable or regenerative land management. So at the CCRCD, we tend to work as liaisons and facilitators between individual farm producers, grassroots organizations, and, and institutions. Uh, with the underlying focus of developing resilient working relationships and really making sure that these projects that we're engaging with um, could stand the tests of time. Um, the process first requires getting to know farmers through multiple site visits, correspondence, and develop an understanding of their struggles goals and their broader vision for land management um, in order to identify appropriate strategies that can build their own capacity towards more, uh, you know, more restorative and regenerative practices. Um, this top right picture right here, sorry, sorry, Lisa, um, is actually part of Common Vision's uh, program over at uh, Riverview, Riverview Middle School. Um, and I actually really love doing site visits there because they have that integration of um, the earthworks and the berms along with you know, the habitat and the food components as well. And below it is um, farther out in East Contra Costa County where this is the urban edge farm with a combination windbreak and hedgerow. So you may look out at the Diablo Valley and ask, where are the farmers? Um, and while we're still working with uh, some large rural farms, you know, out in Brentwood and Oakley, as well as, uh, you know, the ranchers on our public lands, um, you know, Contra Costa's ag lands have been pretty heavily urbanized and suburbanized since the 1950s. So we tend to work with a wider range of urban producers than other Bay Area RCDs. And here in Contra Costa, urban agriculture covers a range of communities and business models that range from uh, food justice oriented nonprofits, uh, safe training spaces for foster youth, education focused farms, uh, such as you know, Sienna Ranch, um, production businesses, you know, or community and school gardens. So with this diversity, when it comes to technical support, one size generally does not fit all. 
Uh, but when it comes to broad benefits and restorative practices within these operations, uh, there are some common themes. So this, you know, for urban agriculture, uh, we're generally looking at smaller sized parcels, you know, of maybe one to four acres in comparison to maybe a 15 to 50 acre rural farm in the Central Valley. Um, you know, but the social impacts within the urban landscape tends to be higher as um, many urban ag operations tend to be uh, collectively managed spaces or common spaces, um, which help to develop a sense of place or belonging, uh, while at the same time, it helps to organize communities to cultivate, uh, cultivate more resilient food systems. Uh, and with this higher number and greater diversity of people um, that gather and share uh, scientific and cultural knowledge, um, there's also more capacity to carry on traditions of meaning uh, tied to specific plants and animals, uh, butterflies as visiting spirits of uh, as visiting spirits being one example. Um, so, as the urban agriculture um, community gardens, urban farms, you know, often act as islands of open space um, within ecologically traumatized landscapes. Um, you know, these operations can be both active refuge and corridors for wildlife um, while acting as highly visible demonstration sites uh, that encourage the adoption of holistic land management practices on, you know, wider scales or watershed scales. And so as the stewardship of biodiversity within our human dominated landscape is a passion that I think brought many of us uh, to this work um, and is the nexus of both um, the agriculture and monarch programs at the Contra Costa RCD. I'll pass it over to Lisa who will describe more about the monarch conservation program and uh, what we accomplished in 2021. Thanks, Derek. Second. Okay. Um, so recognizing the, the drastic decline of, of native uh, pollinator populations, including the Western monarch, um, the, the RCD created a new program um, that we call the Monarch Conservation Program. Um, but we also, we call it the Monarch Conservation Program, but it, but it also addresses um, other pollinators like flies, bees, birds, etc. Um, and so, you know, we don't want it to be a misnomer, um, but it is a charismatic species that people um, are drawn to. So it's it's a helpful um, species to kind of rally behind. Um, in order to best support our pollinator conservation efforts in in Contra Costa, uh, we rely on the latest scientific research on pollinators to ensure that the practices we teach and implement are safe and effective. Um, we want to make sure that uh, we are operating with the most recent, most up-to-date information. Uh, the goals of the program are to restore and establish pollinator habitat. Um, this is a huge help to all pollinators. Um, we, we also want to help facilitate pollinator projects throughout our county and also the region. Um, and a huge piece of what we do as well, including you know, talking to folks like this, is um, to spread information and awareness about pollinators, their threats, and ways to help them, because people can't fix a problem that they, they don't know about. Um, last year, um, in April of 2021, um, we were awarded a grant from the California Association of Resource Conservation Districts. Um, and the National Fish and Wildlife Association, or sorry, Wildlife Foundation to provide technical assistance to farmers and ranchers to plan and implement monarch habitat pro projects on their lands. Um, and the idea being that um, working lands uh, tend to cover a lot more land than just you know, a person's front yard. Um, 
so you know we can have a greater impact if we also include working lands. Um, in June of 2021, uh, we were we worked with our partners and were awarded 30 monarch habitat kits from the Xerces Society for um, Invertebrate Conservation. And these habitat kits consisted of native plants um, for creating pollinator friendly hedgerows um, and included a few types of native milkweeds, which as you know um, from previous talks, that is the uh, monarch's host plant. Um, we were fortunate last year to work with four working lands partners um, with that funding that I mentioned. Um, and it was amazing because they were complete, all four working lands partners were completely different. Um, so I'll introduce you to those in a moment. Um, but I wanted to acknowledge that we had tons of community support. Uh, we had student groups involved. We had local creek stewards, including some of the folks on this on this call, um, and we had other volunteers as well. Um, we also uh, wanted to acknowledge that this spring, the Monarch Joint Venture um, started to send some uh, field techs to do mo monthly monitoring for monarchs at three of the four sites that we planted. So um, we're really excited about that. Uh, they haven't found any monarch activity yet, but. Um, once the once the animals find the uh, plants, I think we're gonna we're gonna see some activity. Um, bottom line, though, is that like lots of conservation work, it takes a village. So the first um, working land partner that I wanted to introduce you to is the Coco Sand Sustainable Farm, um, which is in Martinez. It is on uh, buffer land of the Central Contra Costa Sanitary District. Um, and so they actually use recycled water or their effluent um, to water these plants. Um, and they raise on, on, I think it's three acres of 15 acres, they raise uh, or grow food and donate the food to um, the hungry uh, and other nonprofits that, that help the hungry. Um, the, you can kind of see that the space that we one this is one of two of the spaces that we planted on this farm um, and you can see that it wasn't really being used at all uh, previously um, and that is directly after planting on the right um, it is looking much more lush now um, and i just wanted to also mention that the day after that was that photo was taken um, a local high school group came and mulched the area this is uh, some photos from the day um, that we did the planting um, at Coco Sand, Coco, Coco Sand Farm. And um, we, we had a great time. We, you know, it was, it was amazing because we were able to, you know, establish the habitat for pollinators. We were able to spread info and awareness um, of pollinators and their habitat needs. And then of course, we're also, hopefully bolstering the amount of pollination that happens on this farm. Uh, th these are more recent photos of the area. Um, I'm, I'm happy to say that we have seen tons of plant growth, as you can see, and also we can already see some um, pollinator activity, um, ladybug larva in the top middle, uh, some flies and some other butterflies as well, um, and animals just using the habitat, which is, incredible considering that we planted this in November. The next um, group that I wanted to tell you about is um, a commercial farm that uh, it is called Frog Hollow Farms in Brentwood. And, um, you know, they're very different from the previous farm, um, which is a nonprofit and uh, is fully volunteer um, based. Um, so this, this farm actually took the lead to plant their Xerces kits uh, with their largely Spanish speaking staff. And one of the nice things about the Xerces materials is that they are produced in English and Spanish, um, which makes the information more accessible to a wider, wider population of working land stewards. Our third working land partner um, last year is Sienna Ranch in Lafayette, which is um, a for-profit educational farm. Um, and we were able to do some of the planting with um, some of the homeschool students that come to this uh, ranch a couple times a week. 
Um, and what's really nice about this is because is is that not only were they able to plant the plants, but they're going to be able to see how it changes over time, um, how the plants grow in and how the animals start to use the habitat. Uh, here are some recent pictures of Sienna Ranch. Uh, again, we're seeing great growth um, and pretty minimal plant mortality as of yet. So we're, we're pretty happy about that. Um, the fourth partner that we worked with, and we actually have Kathy Cutting with us here, um, is, is Cal State East Bay, Concord Campus. Um, and we actually planted in uh, two areas on the campus. Um, on the left, uh, you can see a willow. Um, and on the top right, you can see the, the larger area that we planted um, right, at, uh, right adjacent to Galindo Creek. Um, this area is CSU East Bay Concord's Galindo Creek Field Station, um, which is an area that there will be increasing opportunities to volunteer to help weed, water, and attend educational workshops in the future. Um, so we're really glad that we were able to, to get in there and, and do some of this work. Um, the other location that we planted is right near uh, the, the center photos. Um, is right near the campus buildings. And um, it's gonna serve as an easily accessible um, demonstration garden for students and members of the public um, so they can see what's, see what's happening um, right at the location where they are you know, walking around and going to class, et cetera. Um, across these four sites, we were able to plant over 500 plants to create approximately 3,000 linear feet of, of hedgerow. Um, so we're really excited about that, considering that it is our first year of the program. These are some more recent photos of the plantings at uh, CSU. And uh, we were, again, thrilled to see tons of growth, um, especially considering that we have not really provided them a ton of supplemental water, although we will probably need to do that um, in the summer. Um, but we've had minimal plant mortality and um, we're thrilled to see that the um, some of the rhizomes that we planted uh, like in the, let's see, for, for milkweeds, as uh, Tora mentioned, milkweeds are rhizomatous and um, we weren't sure if those were gonna come up, but they've been coming up. So it's been, uh, really rewarding to see that. Um, I'm going to pass it back to Derek to talk a little bit about how you can get involved. Yeah, that was a lot of fun working on those projects with you last year, Lisa. Um, so while we encourage the leadership and the agency of local communities uh, that we're working with throughout the county, uh, many of the agricultural operations um, that aim to enhance habitat on their lands could often use some extra hands because, you know, this is often going above and beyond what they're already managing and doing. Um, and so this might include physical work days to spread mulch, you know, apply compost, weed, and water, but I'll be watching for that pellatory for now on. Um, so if you have any additional skill sets, uh, you know, that could be used in outreach, um, making and setting up birdhouses, fundraising, um, you know, let us know your interests and we could connect you to the right people, um, you know, that could use those skill sets. Um, as of this year, we ended up receiving about seven to nine of the Healthy Soils Program grants that we applied for to install hedgerows and windbreaks, um, you know, on various working land sites throughout the county. Uh, but also uh, Lisa and I, you know, for the 2022 Xerces Kits uh, applications, we submitted and assisted on applications on behalf of roughly 12 partners. Um, you know, so depending on the number that get accepted, we're most likely going to need some help getting getting those plants in the ground, uh, which I think is a highlight of the work. Um, we might need some help with site preparation, transport of the plants where 
if you all know Rob Bennington from UC Cooperative Extension, he so generously offered up his truck. So if any of you have a truck um, or some, you know, will to come get your hands dirty, uh, please let us know and we'll be aiming for that come October, November. Thanks, Derek. I wanted to mention one other opportunity for folks to potentially engage if they're interested. Um, we um, work with our advocacy group, the California Association of Resource Conservation Districts to help facilitate the East Bay Monarch Work Group. Um, it is a group of interested residents, um, you know, scientists, natural resource professionals. We have a, tri a tribal liaison. Um, and others with varied expertise. Um, anyone may join. Uh, we've been meeting about once every two months um, and just wanted to tell you about the group because it's uh, now over 60 strong. Um, we are currently working on a outreach campaign to nurseries to encourage them to sell pesticide free um, California native milkweeds and nectar plants. So some of the stuff that Tori, uh, Tora and Terry touched on um, about, you know, the importance of getting the word out to, to nurseries and to the folks that actually sell these plants. Um, so if you're interested at all in joining the East Bay Monarch Work Group, please feel free to contact me. Um, with that, I think we would just like to thank you and um, you know remind you if you're interested in volunteering or, or if you have ideas about how you might like to get involved or if you have ideas for pollinator projects, please just let us know. Um, our emails are here. We have um, our uh, program URLs also on this page so that um, if you're interested in reading more about these programs or um, reaching out to us, uh, you, can, you can do that. So thank you so much for your attention and um, we're happy to take any questions. We know we're at time, but um, if anyone has any questions, we're, we're happy to take them. Yeah, thank you everyone for listening and for all the work that you do as well. Thank you so much. Um, this has been really, um, obviously we're, we're passionate about this work and we're happy to share about it with you. So um, thanks so much. And um, yeah, look forward to our next uh, Contra Costa Watershed Forum meeting, um, which is going to be July 13th. Uh, so I know it's in a little while, but you will receive an email from me. And um, I hope that uh, you all stay safe and have a wonderful rest of your day.